Good morning, friends. Once again, if you have your but, uh, once again, welcome to Sunday worship. Those who are participating on site and through online, if you have your Bibles, please turn to Genesis chapter forty-one. And it's kind of hard to see on the screen, but we're looking at today Genesis chapter forty-one. We'll be reading from verses fourteen uh, to thirty-six. Okay, so Genesis chapter forty-one. Genesis chapter 41, we'll be reading from verses 14 to 36. Genesis chapter 41, verses 14 to 36. And if you have find, found your passages, please rise. Unless you have health concerns that prevent you from rising, in which case, please feel free to sit. Uh, but otherwise, please rise for the reading of God's word. Once you have fin- found your passage, that is. Okay. Genesis chapter 14, uh, sorry, 41. Verses 14 to 36. This is God's word. Then Pharaoh sent and called Joseph, and they quickly brought him out of the pit. And when he had shaved himself and changed his clothes, he came in before Pharaoh. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, I have had a dream, and there is no one who can interpret it. I have heard it said of you that when you hear a dream, you can interpret it. Joseph answered Pharaoh, It is not in me. God will give Pharaoh a favorable answer. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, Behold, in my dream, I was standing on the banks of the Nile. Seven cows, plump and attractive, came up out of the Nile and fed in the reed grass. Seven other cows came up after them, poor and very ugly and thin, such as I had never seen in all the land of Egypt. The thin, ugly cows ate up the first seven plump cows, but when they had eaten them, no one would have known that they had eaten them, for they were still as ugly as the beginning. Then I awoke. I also saw in my dream seven ears growing on one stalk, full and good. Seven ears, withered, thin, and blighted by the east wind, sprouted after them. The thin ears swallowed up the seven good ears, and I told it to my magicians, but there was no one who could explain it to me. Then Joseph said to Pharaoh, The dreams of Pharaoh are one. God has revealed to Pharaoh what he is about to do. The seven good cows are seven years, and the seven good years are the seven years. The dreams are one. The seven lean and ugly cows that came up after them are seven years, and the seven empty ears blighted by the east wind are also seven years of famine. It is I told Pharaoh. God has shown to Pharaoh what he is about to do. There will come seven years of great plenty throughout all the land of Egypt, but after them there will arise seven years of famine, and all the plenty will be forgotten in the land of Egypt. The famine will consume the land, and the plenty will be unknown in the land, by reason of the famine that will follow, for it will be very severe. And the doubling of Pharaoh's dream means that the thing is fixed by God, and God will surely bring it about. Now, therefore, let Pharaoh select a discerning and wise man and set him over the land of Egypt. Let Pharaoh proceed to appoint overseers over the land and take one-fifth of the produce of the land of Egypt during the seven plentiful years. And let them gather all the food of these good years that are coming and store up grain under the authority of Pharaoh for food in the cities and let them keep it. That food shall be a reserve for the land against the seven years of famine that are to occur in the land of Egypt so that the land may not perish through the famine. This is God's word. Thanks be to God. You can be seated. Before I begin today's sermon, just wanted to make a quick correction. Um, in our Bible study, um, I received a question regarding uh, the height of sequoia trees. Um, if you guys remember two weeks ago, I preached about sequoia trees and how they grew to be 7,000 feet tall. Um, that, simply put, that was a brain fart moment for me. They do not grow up to be 7,000 feet tall. That's, that means a tree will be tall as mountains. They, they do not grow that tall. I made that mistake because I was researching that around 4 a.m. in the morning and plus, I'm more used to the metric system than the um, imperial system that the Americans use. So in my brain fart moment, I forgot to actually convert them and say, hey, that does not make absolute sense. But it is what it is, and that's where my human error comes from. So just just a quick note, sequoia trees are not the tallest. They're one of the biggest. Um, They grow up to the tallest recorded ones are above 300 feet. The real tall ones being the red um, coastal trees also around Northern California. But that aside, now let's get into the sermon, the important meat of the, today's, um, today's service. So, Friends, I want to ask you guys a quick question. What makes 
or breaks the world? Such a loaded question, but I want you to think about it. What makes or breaks the world? In short, what makes it good versus what makes it bad? What makes it build up versus what makes it utterly undesirable and broken? From the North Pole to the South Pole, from the West to the East, from elementary schools to graduate schools, from friendships to president's offices, from nonprofit organizations to corporations, what is one defining factor that makes or breaks each of these groups, these regions, these organizations, these nations? What is one factor that makes or breaks the world? Friends, I believe there is one thing that makes or breaks the world and they have a huge influence on the world. And it's not money. In my opinion, it's people. People make or break things in the world. Mature and skillful people beautify the world. I believe you can quickly think of a few examples where some good teachers, good friends, good bosses, or good, literally good family members have really beautified and glorify your existence. Why? By the virtue of their goodness. And in contrast, you can quickly think of how immature and foolish people have easily soiled your experience in whatever organization, whatever social group, whatever nation you belong to. Think of your families. Think of your schools. Think of your workplaces. Think of the churches and the retreats that you have been to. What was the defining factor that has either completed or destroyed it? And my argument is this, it's the people, particularly the characters and qualities of the people. When you think of a negative experience, most likely there is a negative person that is involved in it. If you think of a positive experience, there is most likely a positive person that is behind those positive experiences. And so it is to my belief what makes the world or breaks the world is people. People are everything. The more and good and mature people there are, the more positive the world or our experiences tend to be. And the more broken and the more immature people there tends to be, the more broken and immature the world or the people that they are in tends to be. And that is why, friends, I'm a little bit concerned about the upcoming presidential election for very obvious reasons. If you have seen the latest presidential debate, and for those who have not seen, I do not recommend seeing it, but for the sake of just being aware, I highly recommend it just taking a glance at it. Why? Because it is sadly ridiculous. The two people who are to be in charge of this country, the two people who are most likely going to be in charge of the country are not showing very good qualities in my honest opinion. And take this as a subjective opinion rather than an authoritative opinion or anything. But in my just humanly experience, I'm a little bit despairing by the current candidates that we have for the president, the office of presidency. Because I, and what is even more sad about that current reality is this, how low America has fallen. Because it's not just those two people that are at fault. The fact that those two people are at the head of the election campaign means that there are a sizable majority of people who support them. They can't be up there without support. That means there's a sizable number of American population who is supporting them. And so that just reflects the current state that America is in. And that is why it makes me sad. Friends, that is why I yearn for good people in my life as well as yours and in the world. Just as good trees create forests that can sustain millions of wildlife, providing shelter and livestock and all sorts of, all sorts of resources that lives can thrive under, in the same way good people, the more they are, they create a habitat or sometimes even a single good person can create such a habitat of safety and peace in the midst of a very broken and twisted and fallen world. 
such as the one that we are living in. And therefore, friends, I don't know about you, but I yearn for good people. In your friendship, in my friendships, in my teachings, in my professions, wherever they are. So friends, before I begin, I want to ask you as well, don't you wish you had good people in your lives? People who are opening their wallets without hesitation when they know that you are in financial need. Don't you want a leader or a boss who leads with skill and walks alongside your struggles? Don't you want a friend who can embrace all of your weaknesses and trust all your secrets to? A coach who can guide you through the pitfalls in life? A parent who can be both a friend and mentor? A governor who governs his district with justice and integrity? A teacher who is gentle yet skillful and disciplined in his teachings? Do you not want such people? I know I do. I desperately want more of such people abundant in every sphere of life all across the world. Because when the world is filled with such people, they will create a world like a giant forest, again, in which all kinds of life can flourish in all its peace and all its beauty. And friends, again, I don't think I am alone in thinking that, right? I think we all want good people in our lives, excellent people in our lives. Why? Because that will be a blessed world that we live in. So friends, then now I ask this question. How do we get such people? How do we get such good people in our lives? You know, we all want such good people, so how do we get them? How do we get more of them? How can we enjoy the company of such people? Do such people grow on trees? Do such people sprout from the ground? Is it just by random chance that some people happen to be good and some people happen to be bad? Or is it the good environment and resources that make such good people? Friends, I believe the answer to that question, where do good people come from, lies in our passage today. So let's take a look at it, shall we? Today's passage, we come back to the story of Joseph, remembering two, from two weeks ago, after his peace was broken by mere two dreams, Pharaoh was in a panic. God said wildfire to everything that he trusted in. He, his peace, his trust in Egypt, and his divine status was broken because of mere two dreams. And he was seeking help, but none could be found until his cupbearer servant finally remembered Joseph, who was stuck in prison for two plus years. So Joseph was hurriedly brought before him, and Pharaoh asked Joseph, a question, a very important question, as we see from verse 15 of today's passage. I have heard it said of you that when you hear a dream, you can interpret it. And Joseph answered Pharaoh, it is not in me. God will give Pharaoh a favorable answer. Reflect with me for a moment. Understand the importance of this meeting for Joseph. Friends, is if this is not an opportunity to appeal himself, when else is a better opportunity? This is the ruler of this country. If he were to get in his good graces, he might have a free pass out of jail. This is a great opportunity. If anyone is used to the ways of the world, this is the opportunity that you need to grab on and not let go. If you, this was your college admissions test, this is the interview, the interviewer that you do not want to mess around with. But Joseph stayed humble. Joseph stayed humble. Friends, perhaps Joseph's heart was beating with excitement as he realized what kind of opportunity laid before him. Because I remember before every major transition of my life, whenever I see an opportunity or see a person who holds control of my life, and I know that whatever I do can either make or break the situation, I usually got very excited and my, feel my palms sweating as well as excitement and fear running across my heart. But instead of being caught up in itself, Joseph simply and humbly acknowledges, not I, but God. This is quite different from the Joseph that we know of. It's quite astounding. 
We remember your 17-year-old Joseph who went off to show off his dreams to his brother and his parents. Oh, look at the dream that I dreamed. In my dream, you know what happened? You guys were all bowing down to me. Such was the arrogance and pride of Joseph. How has that arrogant Joseph be humble so much? So much that he would even give up his own chance at a life of freedom where he is risking his freedom to acknowledge that it is not him, but God. How did Joseph stay so humble? And friends, I believe it's simple actually because God humbled him. At this point, Joseph is 30 years old and the 13 years of his life that he is going through, that was all a lesson in humility. And in particular, I believe God did two things to Joseph to humble him. Number one is slavery. And number two, as we touched upon two weeks ago, is to cut off all of his hope when he was in jail. So let's explore those one by one. So how did God craft humility into Joseph, among other things, by selling him into slavery? Why did God allow Joseph to be sold into slavery? Among many things, it was to make him realize that, it, Joseph, it is your immaturity. It is your arrogance that led you to the state. Remember, Joseph was indeed arrogant. Joseph was indeed inconsiderate. He was telltaling on his brothers and telling them that in his dreams, they served him. And in turn, he was completely blind to what? To the hurt that he was inflicting on his brothers who were reeling from the pain of being essentially abandoned by his father. Remember, his father, Jacob, doesn't even call them his sons. That's how abandoned they were feeling. And Joseph, what does he do? He rubs salts on their wounds even more by provoking them. So I believe Joseph, as he was being sold into slavery and as he was living as a slave, repented in his slavery and also learned to rely upon God's help. He realized what a wretched being he was, in short. In that, and in that realization, he was able to rely upon God's help. And of course, God, having never abandoned Joseph at any point, walked with such a Joseph and blessed such a Joseph. And he, in turn, learned to trust and walk with God, even when he was wrongly accused and in prison. And the second thing that God did to humble Joseph is then to cut off all worldly hope from Joseph, as we explored two weeks ago. Just as we explored about two weeks ago in the wildfire sermon, God burned away the very last hope Joseph held on to, namely people. Oh, this person is going to get me out of jail because of the things that I did for this person. But what does that person do? What does that cupbearer do? Two years, for two years, what did he do? Forget it, completely. The Bible clearly reports the moment he left prison, the cupbearer completely forgot about Joseph. And it's only in today's passage that we remember that he remembers that Joseph was the one who interpreted his dreams. And I believe that's God's intervention, that God himself made the cupbearer forget about Joseph for two years. Friends, you can again imagine what Joseph was feeling at this moment, betrayed, despair, his last reasonable hope that he could easily reach out for has betrayed him. He must have clearly thought, is it so much to ask for someone to remember me? But in his despair, in his betrayal, he also reflected, I believe, on the simple truth. Even people can't be relied upon eventually. They are not 100% reliable sources of salvation. His only help is in God alone. God alone holds the destiny and welfare of his life. Because of the two lessons in his life over more than 13 years, Joseph now stands a humble man before Pharaoh, even before the so-called ruler of this nation, Joseph realizes that it is not he, but God alone who holds the destiny, not just of his life, but of the entire world. So he humbly and objectively admits, it is not I, but God, who will give an answer to you, Pharaoh, and will restore your peace. Not I, but God. 
And friends, I think at this point, we need to ask this question. Why is God so intent on making Joseph humble? Because friends, uh, it's the same question that I believe all of us should ask. Imagine that God is subjecting you, subjecting you right now to torturous pain. And if I were to tell you that the reason why God is subjecting you to such torturous pain is to simply make you humble, do you think that is justified? Do you think that's reasonable? Do you think that it's perfectly fine for God to subject you to such horrendous pain just to make you humble? You have to reflect on that because that's clearly God's intent. Friends, my answer is this. Is humility worth it? Yes, because what's the opposite of humility? Arrogance. Among the thousand poisons that arrogance breeds, one of the things that arrogance does is to make the arrogant person egotistical and self-centered. In other words, such people, such arrogant people, tend to twist things around for their own benefit because they believe what? That they are the most important person in the world. That their opinions are the most valued in the world. That their intelligence is the highest in the world and therefore none else can match it. And what do such people tend to do then? They block off everyone else. They forget about everyone else. They only remember themselves and even twist and make things all about themselves and therefore exalt themselves, even at the expense of others. And such poison, God cannot allow in Joseph to fester. He did not want Joseph, a future governor of Egypt, to be one of those worldly people who twist the resources for his own benefit at the expense of others. And therefore, God went and subjected Joseph to horrendous pain in order that he might learn the valuable lesson of humility. Because that humility, being the vaccine and antidote to pride, is going to help him stay grounded even when he is governor of Egypt. And so, friends, I am reminded once again that among many reasons, I want such humble people in the world especially among the powerful and wealthy. I want people who know and truly admit that the world belongs to God and God alone, not to any man, any resource, any intelligence, or any government, that the world is 100% from the beginning to the end, ultimately governed by God, dictated by God, judged by God, and redeemed by by God and the people who mess around with the world in their own will, outside of the will of God, will receive God's due punishment upon them. For they thought that the world is theirs and in their arrogance they have mistreated the people that are entrusted to them. Such people will receive justice from the just God. So friends, I desire humble people because such Humble people, whatever office or position they might be, know how to respect God, fear God, and make sure that their selfish ambitions don't get in the way of worshiping God, which is to worship God means to love God and to love neighbor. Joseph became such a humble person because of God, but that's not the only thing God did to make Joseph into the good person that we see him today. Although humble people are very precious, make, make no mistake, humble people are extremely precious, and I pray there are many of them. And such humble people are great blessings on the people around them. Humility alone is helpless against the troubles of the world. Humility alone is helpless against the troubles of the world. So God nurtured another important quality in Joseph, one that is just as important as humility, skillfulness, skillfulness. Continuing and going back to our passage that we're reading today, Joseph interprets Pharaoh's two dreams, and though there, he explains that there are, although there are two dreams, they basically contain a single message, that first of all, there will be seven years of prosperity, and then there will be seven years of famine, and the famine is so great that it will make the years of plenty be forgotten. And the reason why God gave two dreams instead of one is because God has determined to make them come true very soon. 
And friends, we have to, again, ask the question, why seven years of famine? Why make people suffer? And as we touched upon last week, it's to basically expose the limits of creation. Egyptian land was incredibly fertile and rich. And that's why it was dangerous. It blinded people to the fact that as rich as the Egyptian land could be, it has its limits and will break down. All creation has limits. The U.S. is no exception. No nation, however powerful, stood the test of time. Name a single nation that existed from time millennium until now. None. They are not trustworthy or worshipworthy. To the impending national crisis, Joseph was prepared. Though Pharaoh didn't ask, he offers a solution. Store 20% of all produce over the next seven years of prosperity in each of the cities. Then Egypt will be able to weather out the storm and survive despite the horrendous famine that are to come. Joseph clearly had the skills and aptitude to not only recognize the problem, but offer a solution. He was skillful and knew what action had to be taken. And friends, perhaps when you're reading through the passage, you might ask what Joseph said. Can anyone do that? Right? It seems like such an easy solution. Oh, a famine is coming. We just have to store up. It seems like such a simple solution, but friends, I want to make this argument. Remember that the Bible doesn't actually give all of the details. Remember that the answer that Joseph gave to Pharaoh is a highly simplified account, most likely. Especially in the book of Genesis, a lot of what the people say are very condensed versions of actually what they said. So in short, what I'm trying to say is this. It's possible that when Joseph was talking to Pharaoh, he actually gave an incredibly detailed plan that mentioned very specific cities, governors, governments, policies, and specific steps that he needs to take. And you might be asking, can you back up on that claim, Pastor Daniel? Can you back up on the claim that Joseph's answer was actually more detailed than the passage that we read today? And friends, absolutely. I'll be going to extreme detail next in my next sermon, but look at the people's response to Joseph's answer in verse 37 and 38. This proposal, after Joseph told him all about all the solution, pleased Pharaoh and all his servants. And Pharaoh said to his servants, can we find a man like this in whom is the spirit of God? Friends, let me ask you this question. Do you think Egyptian government officials are dumb? Do you think Egyptian officials are dumb? Do you think the people who compile the story of Genesis are dumb? And the reason I ask this question is this. Joseph's ethnicity is a Hebrew. Genesis later on talks about how Hebrews are detested before Egyptians. Egyptians detest the Hebrews so much that they couldn't eat on the same table with them. They clearly know of his background. And as desperate and as respected Pharaoh is, it takes a lot of guts for the ruler of the nation to appoint such a Hebrew into the highest ruling position against every other officials, rulers, and aristocrats in Egypt. And as much as God works supernaturally, he never suddenly transforms people's opinions with some kind of magic as supernatural as he is. So how did the entire Egyptian ruling class approve of Joseph? I believe there's only one explanation. Joseph had every single detail down. That's the only other explanation. From his cities to his governors to his people, he knew the strengths and weaknesses of each region, each government district, each governor, each policy that the Egyptians were holding on to. And therefore, he gave a very detailed presentation an argument as to what the Egyptian government needs to do. If it weren't for such a detailed argument, do you think the ruling class would knowingly, easily approve of Joseph on the spot like that? I do not think so. What, what is the point I'm trying to make here? Joseph was skilled more than we give credit for by just simply reading at this simple passage. If he wasn't skilled, I don't think he could have gone over the prejudice and disdain 
that the Egyptians held against the Hebrews. Joseph was that skillful. Otherwise, this passage does not make sense. Also, I believe the reason why we think this is easy because it's in hindsight. Because friends, think of your math problems. Before you know the solution, every math question seems impossible. But once you figure out the answer and once you figure out the steps, once a teacher explains the steps to you in detail and work through the process, the math question seems incredibly easy, does it not? Friends, remember that it takes years of skill to not only diagnose the problem, to, but to offer a quick and simple solution. In hindsight, what Joseph says seems to be easy, but in reality, it, is because, it seems easy because he is a professional and he knows what he is doing. And friends, this is why even good artists are trained. To give a brief example, this is a simplified conversation of, uh, between one of my art friends and the corporate client. The corporate company client asked my friend to do, my artist friend to make something, and he basically made it in five minutes and showed him the result on that same conference area. And the, and the boss, the client, basically asked my art, artist friend, why should I pay you for the work you've done in 20 minutes? And this was my artist friend's reply. Because I was trained to do this in 20 minutes when it would have taken others 20 days. Because I was trained to do this in 20 minutes when it should have taken other 20 days. Joseph was, offer, was able to offer his solution quickly because he was prepared with the best education possible. Remember, he lived in the fields. He had an agricultural background. He learned the Egyptian language, stewardship, management, organizational skills while being a slave. He learned then detailed politics, government, etiquette, people in power, etc. when he was in prison as he was ministering to the political prisoners who were in prison. So although his days were painful and seemingly filled with despair and nothingness, in all of that, Joseph was being trained and prepared by God through such times. It was not wasted. It was his training period. And when the time called for it, when there was a need for such figure as Joseph, he became the solution to the impending problem that Egypt was going to face. Friends, I need not emphasize how many skillful people we need in all spheres of life, from teaching to government, from even nonprofit organizations to corporations. It is people with skill who can offer a much needed solution and breakthrough in the world. So friends, don't look down upon either your education or the opportunities that are offered before you, whether it be professional or otherwise. Be faithful to them. Don't take them for granted, don't take them lightly. The more skillful you are, the greater impact you will have in the world. Now, of course, God detests a skillful worker with corrupt hearts because they will use their skills to explore others rather than to serve people. But he delights in skillful people with humble, God-shaped, God-centered hearts. For such people bring lives to millions of people just as giant sequoia trees provide shade and shelter that no mere small bushes and shrubs can ever provide to people. So friends, you know how I asked the question in the beginning, how do we get more people? My answer is this, through God, through God. Through God, the giant sequoia called Joseph grew. He grew, God grew Joseph as a humble man as well as a skillful one that he may bless the nations around him and save them from their impending doom. In the same way, friends, know that God also seeks to make you, you, into good people. That is why he saved you. Can you believe that? That is the purpose of why he saved you. That is the purpose of why Jesus bled on the cross. Just as God humbled Joseph, God humbles us through the cross, exposing us of our sins, exposing of our weaknesses and our need for God. And just as God was with Joseph, God is now with us because Jesus' blood has paid the price of our abandonment. While we deserve to be abandoned by God, 
Jesus took the abandonment for our sake, that he may be with us forever. And just as God sends Joseph into the government of Egypt, God sends us out into the nations, that we may proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ and make them also live for God and enjoy the God who walks with us. And just like God trained Joseph through his environment, God is training us through the Bible, through our environment, and through the life of Jesus Christ, that we may truly be the people, the human beings that God called us to be, to be good people, to love God, to love neighbor. That is the central purpose of, the, of our salvation, and that is the central message of the entire Bible. So friends, instead of wishing for good people, recognize this. God is calling you to be the good people of the world. Let me just close with just an illustration. Uh, most of our youth group is familiar with him. He's, his name is Nick Vujicic. Although the, this picture doesn't really show, he has no limbs, he has no arms, he has no legs. He recounts in his testimony why he was ever born that way. He was born into a Christian family, and he asked God, he says in his testimony, for eight years he struggled with God. Why did you make me in this, in this way? Why are you subjecting me through these years of torture and pain? Why are you leaving me in such a state? Where is the solution that I want? God, please give me a solution. Long story short, let me paraphrase what he has realized. Through those years of pain, and as he sought God's hope, God, he realized that God wanted him to be the solution that he was looking for. And so he did become the solution unto the people. Because now through him, God is teaching hope. Hope that millions of disabled people like him have never experienced before. But because of him, because he was molded by God, he is able to preach the hope, and he is able to become the solution that he, as a teenager, was looking all those years ago. Friends, in closing, remember, we live in dark times, sadly. I wish that I could say better, but it does not seem like the world is going to get better anytime soon. And in these days, we need people who can be the solution more now more than ever. And God calls us to be such people who, be one, who can become the solution unto the world. Not because we are the solution, but because he is the solution. And he calls us in him to become the solution. Not apart from him, but in him. There's a reason why he calls us salt and light of the world. There's a reason why he calls us a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. That we may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. So will you answer God's call, friends? I leave you with this challenge. Will you answer God's call? Lay your life down that you may bless the world, that you may love the world instead of for your living for your selfish and petty ambitions. Be the sequoias of God that provide shade and life unto the world. Be the blessing unto the world. That is why God molded Joseph this whole time. And that's the same he will do to you. Will you be molded? Will you be the blessing unto the world? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord. You do not leave us alone in our helpless estate, but you constantly come down to us. We still want nothing to do with you so many times in our lives, and because of it, we are actually being broken every day. Um, in our selfishness, in our laziness, in our weaknesses, we see that we're not only broken, but we break others as well. We're not equipped enough to handle the world Father, thank you for not leaving us in such a helpless estate. Just as you exemplify through Joseph, Lord, you create solutions into the world because you are the solution. And whoever is in you becomes the solution into the world. So, Father, help us to not take our pains or environments lightly, but help us to cling to you at all times. Not so we can just enjoy a petty life of our own selfish blessings, but that we may truly be the good people that become the blessing unto the people around us 
and even unto ourselves. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. May your will be done in your church. We praise you. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.